Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I'm excited to have we have Eric Martell. He's co-founder of Eat Street. Eat Street's an online. Hey, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeremy. <laughs> Great to have you. You know, hailing from Madison, Eat Street is an online food ordering service. It was founded in 2010 in Madison, Wisconsin, Go Badgers, by Matt Howard, Eric, and Alex Weiler. The company has quickly expanded to over 10,000 restaurants in over 110 markets nationwide, and they have 100 employees. Eat Street hosts over 6,000 restaurant websites and has partnered with Yelp to include online ordering on Yelp review pages. Eric, thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely. Happy to be here. There's so much I can ask about in just this intro, but I'm going to hold back for a second because I want to get into your story a little bit. But I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, what worked, what, you know, what doesn't work. Um, and I always like to include a fun fact to start. And fun fact about Eric is um, he's actually allergic to orange juice. So if you go out to breakfast with him, do not give him orange juice. He will break out in hives. And he also likes to play the guitar, Jimi Hendrix, but you have had no time to do that over the past four years because it's just heads down with Eat Street. Yeah, you know, you find time here and there, but uh, it's uh, it's pretty amazing how when you start a business, do you watch the clock tick and you're like, oh my gosh. So. Yep, these are the kinds of things that you really need to make time for if yeah. you're going to do it. If I didn't know you were in a conference room, I would at the end ask you to break the guitar out and play a song, but you, I know you don't have it handy. Um, and I know when I was when you were kind of going through the questions, you know, what with, you know, what worked, what didn't work, you wrote e-commerce business is tough. What have you learned about the e-commerce business? What's what's tough about it? Yeah, so I mean, especially in e-commerce, but really with any startup, um, you go in fresh. And we were juniors in college when we started this, and we just expected that um, our growth graph was going to be like a hockey stick, and we were all going to be, you know, out of here and buying private islands in a year. <laughs> and what you realize right. at some point is that um, this kind of business is very much in the trenches. I mean, we provide a necessary service to restaurants, but every restaurant is different. And in order to really satisfy our customers, both the people ordering the food and the restaurants we provide the service to, it just takes a lot of work. And the day-to-day -day life of starting a business isn't that glamorous. It's just a lot of tough work. Um, really, that is kind of the uh, you know sort of lesson learned over the years is that um, you know a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. That's a little bit of a cliche, but um, really when you come down to it, uh, what has made Eat Street successful thus far and what we hope will continue to make Eat Street successful is that we have everybody on the team coming in every day and ready just to do what it takes to get us to that next little milestone. Yeah, And we'll talk about that first step, where that first step was, what it was. But I want to know, so what has allowed this expansion so quickly? It's pretty amazing in even that amount of time, the, the growth that you've had. Absolutely. Um, well, it's like I said before, it's a lot of coffee and a lot of hard work, some pretty late nights. Um, basically, uh, it's always kind of a funny uh, dichotomy that myself and my co-founders talk about in that um, when we walk into our office now and we see a hundred employees we go oh my god you know this has really really grown quite a bit from where it was four and a half years ago yeah. but it's it's very incremental growth and really uh, what it was a year ago for us when we had about uh, 1500 restaurants was saying okay what can we do right now to sign about five more restaurants every single day mm -hmm. um, and basically laying out the metrics and a roadmap to get to that goal and now a year later it's more like hey how can we sign 30 to 40 new restaurants a day what new products can we build to get that extra buck in revenue um, what sort of marketing tactics will get somebody to try our service who so far has not tried it and it's all these little decisions and these, uh, you know, really hard at work plans uh, to implement these decisions that have gotten us to uh, where we are today. But uh, it's funny because you look at it, or I mean, outside when I see it, it's like, wow, you know, this is awesome. But internally, it's just the result of a lot of very, right. very little decisions. It's the grind every single day and just Absolutely. clawing away at it. Now, are all those 100 employees, are they located 
in Madison or do you, do you have them spread out throughout the U S um, so right now we have everybody in Madison, mm -hmm. um, but we mm -hmm. have salespeople who split their time between Madison and being on the road. So how we is it being in Madison, um, attracting talent, hiring talent? Cause it's not like one of the biggest cities in the U S how does that work sure. for you? Sure. Well, Madison is really a unique city because we do have the University of Wisconsin. So we get a lot of people who actually uh, have fed themselves for the last four years with our product who graduate. They have the awareness of it. They've seen it grow and they're really excited to think, hey, you know, I can join this really quickly growing startup. So we draw a lot of talent from the University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, Likewise, we have a, a multi-billion dollar company right down the road in Epic Systems. Um, and a lot of people after working there for a little while start um, looking for a little bit of a smaller, more startup oriented environment. And um, so we have a lot of inbound uh, from there. And finally, I mean, Madison is honestly a fantastic city. It's, uh, it's progressive. It's beautiful, situated between yeah. two lakes. It's one of my and, favorites of all time, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I, if anybody out there hasn't been to Madison, I would highly suggest that you come over here, you check it out for yourself, and you give it a try. We're not the only startup here either. Uh, Zendesk just opened an office. They have over 100 people here. IBM, um, Microsoft, Google. There are lots and lots of tech companies that have chosen Madison because it's a really, really good fit for recruiting talent. Tell me about a little bit about your hiring process because you know hiring one or two or ten people is not easy, and you've had to hire 100 people. Mm -hmm. So how did you, you know, as a startup, when you have so much responsibility all across the board, now you're having to just grow people. What's your hiring process look like? Sure. Well, it's changed over the years. Um, when we went from the three founders to hiring our first couple employees, they were actually just our friends because uh, really we had to sell ourselves as well as the company to them at that point mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know, you know how hard we've worked for this. You can be a part of it and you believe that this will be successful. Um, and they were there firsthand to witness the growth thus far. So they were really excited to come on board. Um, as we've grown, as we've raised investment capital, as our revenues have gone up, we've obviously branched beyond our group of friends and started looking for professionals um, of all varying degrees of experience, including you know, folks that are much better at programming than myself and my co-founder Alex and folks who, you know, have 20, 30 years of sales experience. Um, really more than anything, our mentors have been very important in that process. Just talking to them, asking them as they grew companies, yeah. how did they uh, go about the hiring process? Yeah. And I mean, we've made mistakes along the way. That's the most natural thing that could happen. But overall, at this point, um, we have it down to a point where we feel very confident that by the time that somebody is chosen to be on the Eat Street team, they're going to be a really great fit for the company. Yeah. So tell me about, and then we're going to get into the mentors later, but tell me about what some of the advice the mentors gave you with hiring and what were some of the mistakes that you made that others should avoid that you avoid now? Sure. Well, I mean, the first most obvious one is like run a background check <laughs> at some point or another. That makes sense. Um, you know, getting into a little bit more of a zoomed out perspective, it's really easy to fall in love with somebody during an interview, mm -hmm. but uh, looking up references and sort of actually like getting a sample of the work that they did, whether that be sales or engineering or uh, marketing otherwise, um, is really probably a better indicator for the long term success of an employee because mm -hmm. uh, people can dazzle you. And um, as college kids back in the day, we were pretty easily dazzled. But um, as we've gone on, uh, you know, what you really learn to do is sort of probe into a person's past or if they're just right out of college, honestly, then it is a little bit more of a crapshoot. But um, you just look for the enthusiasm and the attitude. And, um, you know, when you learn to pick up other people who are high energy, who are willing to work really, really hard because they believe in what you're doing, that is, I think, the right way to build a great company. So what were some of the mistakes that you made that you now avoid? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we we hired folks who we thought um, you know had resumes that were really strong, but if you actually put them under a microscope, they might not be as strong as they look. So really taking something at face value, you know, the VP of something, make sure that it is in fact the VP of something significant. Uh, you know, don't just take at face value that somebody increased company revenue 
by 700% when they were a salesperson without actually asking questions about why and how and what their mm -hmm. contributions in that were. Mm -hmm. So really getting into those detail-oriented questions tends to like tell a much more complete story about something that somebody can put on their resume. Yeah, yeah. Um, so because, I mean, obviously people is very important with the company, but um, I want to hear a little bit about you. What, where'd you grow up? What were big influence for, for you growing up? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, uh, just north of Milwaukee. Um, so I've lived in Wisconsin my entire life. Um, I would hands down say that uh, the people that shaped me the most were my parents. Um, both of them um, were entrepreneurial in okay. their own um, My mom runs a uh, consulting business and um, my dad actually worked um, within the federal government his entire life, um, but what makes my dad more entrepreneurial is that he was the first of his family to uh, go to college and sort of like pave his way that way. So mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, my parents really instilled like a pretty good work ethic, at least I'd like to think, um, but at the same time they also taught me to question why and think outside of the box the entire way doing it. Yeah. So, what were some of the, what are some of the influential moments you remember growing up, or advice that your mom gave you early on that is kind of, or your dad that this sticks out to you now? Sure, sure. Um, thinking about that, uh, my dad actually he went to school at Wisconsin on a uh, track scholarship. So oh, wow. I uh, kind of grew up as a runner. Um, and sort of expected to kind of follow in that, um, you know, in that track. And it was a really, uh, it was a shaping moment for me when I went off to high school for the first time. And um, I was a very good runner, but I wasn't the best runner anymore. And having a conversation, that was a, uh, that was a really, really good um learning experience with my dad was kind of talking to him about how you're not infallible and there's always going to be somebody who's more talented, who's really going to get the job done and really to be intrinsically pleased with your own growth as opposed to extrinsically pleased trying to live up to something else or, uh, you know, comparing yourself to other people. Yeah. So that's tough uh, to do. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, it's translated well into the company because, um, you know, we more, often than not, are just focused on being as successful as we can be without worrying so much about whether or not, you know, w we are extremely gratified when we hear of other companies doing extremely well. And at the same time, we try to be a ferocious competitor within right. our own space. There's that competitive nature for sure. Mm -hmm. What did, um, tell me, how did you, you have two other co-founders. How did you meet them? Um, yeah, so uh, Matt Howard, who's our CEO now, was uh, next door to me in the dorms. Um, so my freshman year, I met him on like day three or something. Um, and um, Alex Weiler was introduced to a friend, also my freshman year of college. Um, so uh, we knew each other for two years before we started a company together. And uh, we were great friends. I was living in the same apartment as Matt at the time that we started the company. Which, you know, is its own can of worms in a way because starting a company with your best friends is, uh, you know, something that can be both great and terrible uh, depending on kind of the circumstances. Right. But uh, we've been pleased. So how did you do, divide up the responsibilities? You know, one person's got to be CEO, one's got to be CO, one's got to be CTO. How did you mm -hmm. work that out? So um, we went almost a year and a half before we even came up with those titles. Mm -hmm. But um, it was it was just kind of like a match made in heaven. We all do have like very different skill sets. Um, when we started the business, um, Matt at the time had an internship selling cars for Wisconsin's largest car dealership, and he actually sold more cars than any of the full time guys. Wow. That so it was like, wow, you know, this guy is going to really, really be able to sell the product that Alex and I build. Alex and I had a more technical background. We're both engineers. Um, yeah. And uh, really, uh, when I actually had the idea for this, I thought to myself, who's like the smartest guy that I know who can fill in all the cracks on all the stuff that I don't necessarily know how to do when it comes to web development? And um, Alex was a supernatural fit. So I, you know, I couldn't be happier with the two co-founders that I have. And um, the responsibilities and kind of our strengths and weaknesses have grown organically to the point where we recognize them now. Um, you know, I'm a little bit more operations driven. Alex is an excellent programmer. Matt has continued to run sales just perfectly and raise money and everything that goes along with that. And um, 
really having respect for each other's strengths and weaknesses just kind of led to us naturally fitting into the roles that yeah. we have. I mean, you do often, Eric, hear of people meeting their co-founder or future business partner as like their roommate and friend. What are some things people should watch out for when starting a business with a good friend? What are some, I guess, what were some of the tough moments where you guys obviously had to duke it out a little bit? Mm -hmm. So none of us are all that confrontational, and the problem with that is that um, none of us are really used to arguing then either, um, but the business quickly drives the, the necessity to have arguments, and at first, I personally, and I think that they as well, took it really personally just because we didn't have a lot of experience in arguing out points passionately without feeling kind of personally offended. Right. Um, the most important part about maintaining those friendships and those relationships is probably to accept that you know we can have philosophical disagreements on the direction of the company, but at the end of the day, we still respect each other, right. and um, it isn't a personal thing. Right. The other big part of it is giving each other enough space. Um, obviously, with a job as all-encompassing as this, it gets really easy that after somebody leaves for home and it's 11 o'clock and you think of something that could totally wait till tomorrow, you call them up and then you realize that you woke them up and, uh, <laughs> you know, we all see enough of each other that um, in the spirit of maintaining our friendships, you really have to respect like another person's privacy at a certain point as well. Mm -hmm. And disagreements come along the way. What What's a disagreement you guys had maybe with the direction and how you come to, you know, actually a final decision? Sure. Well, that was actually one of my bigger learning experiences too, because um, we really uh, uh, we recently implemented a relatively minor feature of our service that allows people to order ahead, um, and I had viewed it as being logistically very difficult to pull off for customer service. That um, if somebody ordered their food for a week from now, what are the chances that maybe a restaurant loses the order or something, and the food just never? Someone shows forgets up something. There's a lot of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So that was always my concern, and I like I always thought that the cost benefit analysis of this was going to create more pain than it would make something worthwhile, right. and that was in direct um, you know disagreement with uh, the opinions of my other co-founders. And um, really what we had to do is uh, dive into the numbers and statistics of like how many requests per day are we getting f uh, coming into customer service, people yeah. saying, hey, we really want this. Um, what can customer service do in its processes to uh, really reduce the risk of any of this? Mm -hmm. And um, what could this ultimately do for revenue? And what we ended up doing is deciding, hey, you know, this is worth an experiment. And it's been a stunning success actually so far for the company it's really made a difference for our overall revenue our restaurants are getting more orders so they're happy and things are going off relatively well without uh, too many issues um, because customer service has done such a good job uh, preparing itself for that but um, you know that was something that I had gone into just completely confident that I was right on and um, it's I good to have had, disagreements though because then you have to prove out that what exactly. is actually working. Yeah. So I mean really learning to eat the humble pie and I sent off an email when all was said and done to my other co-founders and um, our head of marketing who also had really been pushing for this and said, hey guys, you know, I was I was completely wrong on this one and I'm really glad that you guys put your hand on it. Um, and so again that gets to the point of not looking at things personally and just you know owning up that uh, nobody has you know a perfect perspective on what's going to be successful or not yeah. Eric I find that so fascinating you know because with three people they're gonna they may have you may have three separate opinions what's another case where you either you or someone else you know obviously didn't see eye to eye and then what actually happened because it sounds like you're you guys are very good at just looking at Proving out mm -hmm. what did the numbers show as opposed to taking it personally. What was another instance uh, where that yeah. happened? Um, well, I mean, go, rewinding a little bit, we um, were originally Badger Bites in Madison, and then we were Brew City Bites in Milwaukee, and I see Eats in Iowa City, and we expanded to 17 separate localized brands. And Let me, uh, let me pause for a second, Eric. Tell people a little bit more about the service. They can kind of envision what sure. was Badger Bites and yeah. Brewer Bites, and what is it now? 
So um, the service has become a lot more complicated than it used to be. But originally, what our idea was is we could take all the restaurants in an area, put them on one website, and people could basically look and see what restaurants delivered to them in a city. So for Badger Bites, uh, you would sign on, you would see all these Madison restaurants, you could order right on this one website, and we would send the order over to the restaurant, and the mm -hmm. restaurant would make the food and deliver it themselves. We never had anything to do with that. Yeah. Um, so when we went to Milwaukee, we started signing up restaurants, and we thought, hey, you know, this local branding thing, uh, you know, worked really well in Madison, let's do it again in Milwaukee. So if you had gone to Brew City Bites back in the day, you would have seen about 100 Milwaukee restaurants. Um, and um, we did that for 17 markets nationwide. And um, at that point, we realized, hey, maintaining this brand is really, really difficult. Um, so, uh, you know, I actually, I do get some things right. Um, but uh, this was another case of me actually disagreeing and saying, I think that we get a lot of uh, kind of social equity in the communities that we're in by uh, locally branding it. And it feels like we're more connected to the restaurants because our brand is very close to the I restaurant. can see that argument. You know, Badger yeah. Bites, you know, okay, I'm in Madison type of thing. Yep, and it was red. I mean, the website, you know, matched the university. And Milwaukee was yellow to match Marquette and uh, UWM. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, uh, you know, the other side of the coin was that logistically it was very, very difficult to order all that marketing material and um, then uh, more importantly we weren't really building out a global brand anything that when somebody moved from Milwaukee to Madison they would know to still use right um, and so uh, the decision to switch to Eat Street was also one where every single one of us the founders the leaders within the company really kind of saw both sides of the argument and um ultimately uh was more a leap of faith than anything because um you know that's you don't the kind of numbers thing. to back it up at that point back it up yeah um, but really that was just kind of deferring again to a lot of mentors and a lot of folks who had grown businesses before and sort of seen, you know, what are they, what do they think about this issue? Yeah. And what we eventually, you know, really kind of agreed was that we had the consensus of a lot of really smart people who we respected saying that this made sense to do. Yeah. And when we did it, it was a little bit of a painful transition at first, but now we couldn't be happier. And there's no way we could have 110 rands right now in 110 cities. That would right. be just a nightmare. <laughs> so obviously we talked about two instances where your prediction wasn't right. Tell me about one that was and when they disagreed sure. with you. Yeah, well, I mean, this one isn't so much them disagreeing, but um, originally uh, – when uh, we were all kind of uh, looking for something to do on the side, I was the one that actually had the idea for this business. And um, what I had recognized was that there were a couple competing brands out there, one of them being Campus Food was in Madison, um, that did something relatively similar, but it charged you a buck every single time that you ordered on their website. And I thought to myself, hey, you know, I know two extremely talented guys who I can get together with, um, and we can build something that's going to be every bit as good and better, and we can do it without charging people. So actually, uh, even getting people on board in the very first place, um, by the end of day one, we were all sold and ready to go. But it took a, you know, sitting down in a living room with Alex and Matt for a couple hours and really hashing out whether or not this was a feasible idea. Um, you know, that was kind of the inception of this entire yeah. thing. Was down and. You know, at first, when you uh, when you think, okay, like you know, we're just twenty year olds at the time. Like, is there any way that we could be successful on this? Uh, you know, there were some doubts. And uh, what were the I'm, doubts uh, thrown around? Um, I think it was just you know, we always joke that our first Google search was um, how do you start a business, and our second Google search was uh, how do you make a website. So uh, I mean, we were just. But you're very technical. Yeah, yeah, you're very technical. I mean, I saw you did an internship at Intuit. I mean, if you look at sure. what you did, it's mm -hmm. all software engineer, software engineer, software yeah. engineer. Yeah. So why so, why were you googling uh, googling that? Both yeah. Both of those internships actually took place after we started this business. Oh, I gotcha. 
But um, even so, uh, you know, the great part about big companies like Intuit is that, um, you know, you are a supporting piece in a much, much, much larger, well-supported environment. Yeah. But to create a website from scratch and keep it online and keep it up to date and know everything you need to know about yeah. building a service from the ground up was something that I just had had no experience with at the time that we started this business. I ask about the doubts, Eric, because there's a lot of people – who that would have halted them. They would have been in that living room like, we are only 20, we don't mm -hmm. know what we're doing, this is crazy. What yeah. What was it about you, the three of you that made you go, you know, we could do this? Yeah, um, you know, you could call, call it kind of childish naivete. Um, we uh, just had a lot of self-confidence uh, that we would be able to learn everything that we would have to along the mm -hmm. way. And to this day, I mean, I still am learning. Um, if you uh, listed out my responsibilities on a piece of paper right now and asked me cold if I was really qualified to be doing these things, I'd say, you know, I'm still learning about them, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I think you could just work and work and work for years and years. And I've seen startups that actually, you know, are in pre-launch for so long because you can always come up with excuses of why you're not quite there yet. Yeah. But really more than anything, what you have to do is just kind of hold your breath and jump into the pool and know that it's going to be cold, but um, mm. you know, you're know uh, you learning as you go. So tell me about after that living room meeting, Eric, mm -hmm. what was the original version like? At what point did you get the original version out and what did it look like? What did it do? Yeah. So that oh, and we always say that we uh, started in February of 2010 because that's when our first website launched. This um, original meeting was uh, six months earlier, and um, we were very, very excited to get rolling on the product. Excited enough, in fact, that we went out and um, bought a subscription to a hosting company that we couldn't cancel, and spent almost like all of our like summer job study on it. Um, and then it was like day seven where it was like, wow, you know, we really have a lot to do and a lot to learn to actually get this together. But at this point, you know, we're already, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in the red a little bit personally and we really want to like make sure that we get there. So um, it took six months to make the website and that entailed learning everything that I, you know, knew up until then about website design. And it was rough. It was very rough on the edges. In fact, um, the first day, I think we had 10 or 15 orders, and it was like all but one of them were our very, very close friends, um, even though we passed out thousands of flyers. But, uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, at that point, the website was barely usable. So, Why? What did, um, the, what did that original website do? So that original website just took every restaurant, it listed it out right in a list, you could click on it, you could order food, um, and it would send a fax to the restaurant, and the restaurant would get the fax um, and make the food. What we learned eventually is that restaurants have delivery ranges, so if a person's on the west side of Madison, the restaurant's going to be really mad if it gets its own order, or, or an order from there, if it's in downtown Madison, um, it won't be able to deliver the food. So uh, that was about the first phone call we got. We had fax machines jamming and no kind of fallback strategy on that. Um, it was a real tough time. And during that time, we were all full-time students. So I remember the website would go down and I'd have to run out of a lecture uh, into the hallway to bring the website back online. Um, but uh, really, it was... Uh, you know, any customer who was ordering from us in the early days was really doing it as a favor to us probably more than anything. So then how did you get those first businesses on the site? Or, you know, do you have to, yeah. do you just put them on and then, or I guess, how does that arrangement work? Sure, sure. Um, so to this day, we have an arrangement with every restaurant that we work with. Um, where we'll say, hey, we can bring you basically these incremental customers, people who wouldn't have been ordering from you otherwise, and for that, we'll take a cut of the transaction, and that's how we make our money. Um, Was that the original so, idea? Um, mm -hmm. Because I know you saw camp, you know, other places were yeah. charging the person. Was that the original idea, or did that morph? Um, well, we knew that campus food was, in fact, charging both sides of the equation, so that we thought that we could make money just with one side of the equation. Got it. And we were actually less expensive than them, and that has held true pretty much to this day. Campus food is no longer around, but um, to this day, we uh, feel, uh, we're less uh, we're less expensive than the vast majority of our significant competitors. So. Um, 
when uh how'd just, you get uh, the original restaurants yeah. on board so that was actually our uh that was our co-founder matt who's our ceo now mm-hmm. and again really more than anything it was matt sitting down with the restaurant owner actually sometimes like having lunch with them and saying you know we don't have any track record we don't even have a product right now but just like believe in us like trust me when I say that I'm going to work very very hard and if it all falls through for you at least you can know that we're going to print out a hundred thousand flyers that we're going to pass around Madison with your restaurant's logo on it so right. you know you're going to be visible that way and basically like look at it as a marketing expense and if we don't get you orders there's no inherent risk for you right there's no risk for them so what what why would mm-hmm. someone not come on board well, originally it was just distrust of three college kids not taking their money and running away to Mexico, probably. But um, really, uh, you know, it still is a very easy sales pitch. But in the early days, um, more than anything, it was a lack of a track record that was uh, the thing that was getting restaurants to say no. So when we launched, we had five restaurants. Um, we had sold those restaurants months and months prior and uh, kept on thinking that we were going to launch and then finding more problems with the website and holding off. So we owe quite a bit to those original five restaurants for putting up with the early days as we were learning how to do this business more effectively. So Eric, what have you learned from from Matt about selling? It sounds like he's a master seller. If he, he's a top yeah. salesman at a car dealership, what have you learned? Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, the majority of my selling these days comes to uh, picking up new employees and getting them to believe in the vision of the company and raising money with yeah. investments. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of restaurant sales ever, honestly, but um, really more than anything, uh, what I think helps sell the most is really believing in what you're saying. And yeah. Matt is a very authentic person. Um, and when I tell a person, hey, come work at Eat Street because we are changing the way that the restaurant industry works, it's because I actually believe it. Mm-hmm. And when I tell an investor, hey, put in money because we're going to make you money back, it, I, I very fundamentally believe it. And I think that that honestly uh, speaks to Matt's integrity and what I've learned from him because Matt has never ever said anything to a restaurant uh, that he doesn't believe. When Matt says like, hey, I can't make a promise in the very early days of our company that this is even going to work out, but you can very much believe that we're going to uh, you know, bleed in the process of trying to make this uh, successful. Yeah. A restaurant owner knew that Matt was being honest because Matt actually was and then that three month period we passed out a hundred thousand flyers so it was yeah. tell me about those days so why a hundred thousand that's a huge amount of flyers uh you know that gets back to naivete too and um really what we should have probably been doing looking back on it was refining the product um but uh what our original goal was is just like get the traction where badger bites is a household name so uh, we didn't even, you know, have the common sense to probably go online and look at somebody else printing out flyers until about halfway through that process. We were buying inkjet printers, uh, printing out flyers at our own house, and the printer would wear out and break almost once every two weeks. Wow. And once, uh, once we had a big stack, it was just like our tradition that, uh, you know, from 7 until 9 p.m. every night, we'd go out and we'd be – Passing out flyers, taping them to doors, sneaking into apartment buildings. We weren't supposed to be putting flyers in. I mean, it was very, very on the ground, on the ground combat at that point. Um, but what it really did do is that people recognized the brand by the end. They weren't necessarily using it, but in Madison, Badger Bites had become like a name that a lot of people were familiar with. Yeah, and you picked up customers from that. Right? Yes, yeah, we did. Not that many, though. Um, we, uh, after three months and 100,000 flyers, we only had about 800 customers, which works out to 0. 0.008 customers per flyer. Not exactly the uh, greatest uh, kind of statistic. I mean, that was more disheartening than heartening at that point. I mean, but, you did get name recognition, you said. Would you, sure. going back in the same point in time, would you do the same thing or what would you do differently? No. So what was a really big breakthrough, the original breakthrough with restaurants was um, basically working with a restaurant and saying, hey, you know, right now, 
um, we're not adding an incredible amount of value to the consumer who's trying to order the food because the food is exactly the same whether or not they call in the order or um, use our website. And keep in mind, this was 2010. The internet wasn't quite as prevalent, and smartphones weren't really a thing. And more importantly, the website itself wasn't really that great. So people were still opting to call in orders over use our service. Um, what we did um, was go to restaurants and say, hey, if you're willing to knock five bucks off the price of your menu, we will personally pay you back three of that. But let's see how many people will try your restaurant for the first time if you run a huge deal with us. And um, I mean, it was a little bit, you know, Groupon-esque that way. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that is when we really had a breakthrough. We don't do that quite as much anymore because now we have a product that really works super well and we can firmly believe like this is the best website to order food from, mm -hmm. uh, way better than calling in an order. But in the early days, that's when we started seeing exponential growth was when we were working with restaurants to give cost conscious college students really great deals on their food. Yeah. And the restaurants were happy because they'd see that after they ended running a special with us, the next week their orders would still be up like 15 or 20%. Yeah. So, Eric, obviously you said the original version was mm -hmm. not great. It was clunky. Sure. So tell me, but you said it modified throughout. What were some key things that you included throughout the product on the product side to today that what makes it, you know, sure. the best online experience? Yep. Well, um, we have, I mean, first and foremost, um, and this is probably within the last year, year and a half, we've become a mobile first company. So we're really proud of our mobile products. Um, and our website just functions very well. It loads quickly. It looks pretty, all of that great stuff. The other things that we do is we offer rewards. So if you order from a restaurant um, enough times, um, we actually give a deal that the restaurant subsidizes to the customer. We're saying, hey, you know, this is um, – really uh, beneficial uh, for your customer retention and we have facts to prove that and people love working towards their next rewards or next little challenge mm -hmm. so um, more than anything um, it's an incredible eye for detail though um, I used to have no eye for detail and these days what we're doing constantly is checking you know hey if we move this button over this much how do people react to that and what we want uh, the product to be is almost like invisible in that like our uh, people ordering food glide through the process don't even think twice about it because they already know how to use it the first time that they're doing it yeah so what was something you included in the process that made it that much easier from a user perspective sure sure um well i mean almost by definition those are the very very little things but um what uh one of the things that comes to mind for me first of all is just the navigation on the website, knowing exactly where and how to get to the menu and then order your food as easily as possible. I, the website used to be very cluttered. There was stuff all over the place. And at this point now, if you go to eatstreet.com, you're going to see just one big question. It's what's your address? Put it in to see the restaurants that deliver to you. Mm -hmm. And on the next page, the only thing that you're going to have is restaurants um, that uh, you know are going to take you right to the restaurant's menu. So um, really kind of getting up and uh, whiteboarding out the flow of the website and figuring out exactly how people thought about it and bringing in outsiders who don't look at it all day every single day has helped us to really drive that funnel. And that's been very important for us. Yeah. So Eric, what was something from a customer perspective of they when they went through that that surprised you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we used to even have, uh, we had text that looked very much like a link. And um, it didn't even cross my mind. I mean, this is a long time ago, maybe two years at this point. But um, it didn't even cross my mind until we brought in our friends and people off the street and put them on a big screen TV. And we were sitting on a couch watching them use the website. Right. And it was like everybody was trying to click on this thing. 
and it was just a stylistic frill, but everybody thought that that was actually going to take them somewhere. Okay. So, I mean, you learn these little things. I, I always talk to the engineers and designers about it. The most painful thing for me, honestly, even to this day, is watching people use the website for the first time because, like, I know how it's supposed to work, and right. watching people try to use it differently just really, I mean, it's very valuable, but it just accentuates, you know, what the bad decisions have been in the past. Right. So what about, uh, obviously, you probably get a lot of requests for people to change this or add that. What are some things that you intentionally left out? Sure, sure. Um, well, for a long time, it gets back to, like, that group ordering that we talked about. You know, what we need to do in order to make a change is prove that either the vast majority of people are confused um, on how to use the product or that um, basically the pros outweigh the cons um, when it comes to impact for the business as a total. Mm -hmm. And that's not just revenue. That comes down to we have a finite um, bandwidth of customer service, the amount of calls that we can take at a given time. If we anticipate that adding a new feature is going to push us above that, where all of a sudden restaurants are calling our customer support because they're confused about something, and we can't service our restaurants in a way that we find acceptable, that's something that we will either have to adjust our staffing or mm -hmm. you know, we have to put on the back burner for another time. Yeah. So um, you know, decisions like that are we're in the process of implementing the ability to order as a group where you send out a link and everybody can order um, together. Mm. And I think it's going to be a great product. But we've really had to explore things like that when it comes to really changing up the uh, the functionality of our website because, again, what we want to make sure is that we can still provide top-notch service and um, create a top-notch product that isn't going to actually inadvertently set us back. So these are things that we take a long time and we really go through with a fine-tooth comb to figure out whether or not it's right for the business yeah. at this point in time. Yeah. So Eric, what were some, some big turning points? In the business. Sure. Well, um, I referenced the big specials earlier. Um, we launched in February of 2010. We ran our first big special, which was, believe it or not, free General Tso's chicken in Madison. Free. Free. For the free as beer. Um, on uh, September 1st, uh, 2010. And up until then, the most orders we had had in a given day was 35. And the first day that we blasted it out, we had 280 orders. Wow. And I remember it like it was yesterday because we learned a lot those couple days but more than anything it was very excited and it was a very positive experience uh definitely stressful but very positive and we were actually in the restaurant at that point printing off orders and bringing them to the kitchen it, it was a crazy couple days so they put you to work in the kitchen yeah. yeah uh so we learned we learned quite a bit from that and we really kind of learned what our early success uh strategy was going to be so we kept on running these deals and we went from, I think, about 1,000 customers at the beginning of that September to um, almost uh, 6,000 by wow. the end of the year. So that was great. Um, after that, uh, you know, what we realized at some point, though, was that that wasn't necessarily the most sustainable business model. Um, there have been, you know, other businesses that were 100% deal-oriented that, you know, eventually kind of the margins called on them. So we had to figure out other ways to uh, be successful. And one of those was that we were researching new markets that we were going to go into, and we realized none of our restaurants in these new markets have websites. And we thought, hey, well, we have an online food ordering platform. What if we could start hosting websites as well? So what we started doing is providing restaurants their own build-it-yourself website. It takes us about a minute to set up. And um, restaurants uh, basically can use that as their website, and it's very high quality. And today we have 6,000 of these. Wow. And that means that if I Google Joe's Pizza and Joe's Pizza is an Eat Street website, it's going to show up as the number one result, and uh, people can order right on a branded Joe's Pizza website powered by us. Um, that was a huge turning point, and that just came as like, a project that one of our very early interns came up with, uh, which goes to show that inspiration comes from kind of all directions and from all people. And that has become a huge moneymaker for the business um, and really one of our uh, core competencies is hosting these 6,000 and growing websites. Um, what was the project that they came up with? You said the intern came up with it. What did they see at the time yeah. that it turned into this? So 
it was uh, it was two interns. Um, one of them was in charge of researching new markets, and the other one was an engineering intern. And um, the uh, intern who was in charge of researching new markets talked to the engineering intern and said, "Hey, you know." it really sucks. I can't find websites for these people, but does that mean that like maybe you guys could make a website? Hmm. So the engineering intern came to me and said, Hey, you know, can I make a WordPress template for a, we a restaurant website? And all it'll be is a link eventually to, um, you know, whatever our website was in that area. So that was the very beta test. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you know, take a couple days on it. And he pushed out the prototype in like three days. And, uh, we had three restaurants live by the end of then week one, and um, what we saw is like, oh my god, you know, these restaurants that are doing this are getting a lot more orders. So it was at that point that we had some numbers to really back that this was a valuable kind of product offering. Started uh, putting a lot more resources and energy into it, and mm -hmm. now we're very happy with these websites. Yeah. So deals, websites. What were some other big turning points? Yeah. So, um, you know, it was a fantastic personal validation to close both our Series A and Series B rounds. Our Series A was about two and a half million. Our Series B was about six million. Um, so, you know, that was the point when my parents were like, wow, big thumbs up. You know, we believe in this now. And it's, uh, you know, it's been great just to see that successful uh, entrepreneurs have thrown money in our direction because they believe that we're following in their path. Mm. Um, closing this deal with Yelp recently has been very I want to go back to the, the raising money because that in sure. itself is a full-time job. What was Absolutely. that process like? What did you learn from it? Mm -hmm. So Matt um, led the process, but I was a, uh, I was a pretty crucial support in there. Um, we've gone through several rounds of financing, starting with an accelerator generator out of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. uh, they still ma uh, We maintain a very close relationship with them. They're some of our greatest mentors. Um, we closed a bridge round of 500000 three months before closing the Series A. Those were like the craziest four months of Matt's life. And during that time, Matt was uh, traveling between uh, California and Chicago and Madison almost on a weekly basis. And the great thing about a revenue generating company was that we could actually put our financials on the table and say, hey, you know, we've got something here. We make money. Uh, we have all these partnerships with these restaurants. But at the same time, um, getting back to Matt's honest salesmanship, Matt was going in front of these investors and saying, we think that we're onto something here. We think that it can be a hundred times bigger than it is today in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And um, what um, I think that the investors saw in um, Matt and my pitch was that we honestly stood by our word on it and we were willing to act and make that happen. And so... We have um, eight times more restaurants now than we did a year ago. We were at 1,500 and now we're over 10,000. Um, and we've basically done exactly what we told our investors we were going to do, which definitely helps out it's raising a good more feeling. money. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of you know my experience at least with the raising money. At what point do you decide to raise money? Because obviously you're bringing in revenue. Um, really for us, um, it came down to, um, our Chicago competitor Grubhub has done incredibly well as well. And, um, we saw them as being a, uh, very aggressive company that obviously wanted to really dominate the market. And we thought, Hey, if we don't raise money right now, we can keep this alive. We can keep on going, but we can't grow fast enough to really like lay, uh, or dig our heels into the markets that we're in and go to new ones. So for us, the decision to raise money more or less was driven by uh, the desire to be one of the big players in this space, which we saw blowing up based on other companies that had also raised money and were moving very fast. Yeah. So that was kind of the tactical reasoning for yeah. raising money. Yeah. And so, Eric, obviously, if you can't talk about it, at that time when mm -hmm. you were going to investors, what kind of numbers did you have to present to them? Yeah, we. Uh, I I would prefer to stay away from that, but That's we okay. were at um, when we closed our Series A, we were at about five hundred restaurants. When we closed our Series B, just in January of this year, we were at about twenty two hundred restaurants, and um, now we're a little over ten thousand. So we've added the majority of our restaurants between January uh, and today. Congratulations! That's great. Thank you. Um, and so you were when I interrupted you. You were going to go into big partnerships as a, sure. a turning point. 
Yep. So that was that was the most recent kind of uh, game changer for us was um, Yelp noticing how quickly our restaurant base was growing and saying, "Hey, you know, we're one of the world's most trafficked websites. We have people coming to our pages. At the same time, it's not our core competency to support online ordering with all the customer service that that entails, the uh, detailed relationship with the restaurant, um, making sure that they received orders, that the orders arrive on time. I mean, we're." fundamentally a logistics company as much as anything else. Um, so Yelp said, we can tell that you guys are really good at that and you're growing like crazy. And we also uh, drive you know, an unfathomable number of people to our website. This really seems like a match made in heaven. So we started talking to Yelp a little over a year ago about this, and um, it went live about a month ago. Yeah. And uh, it was it was a really surreal moment when we saw Eat Street ordering right on Yelp pages. But that's uh, huge. it's gone great so far. Yeah, that's huge. So how did that start? Um, well, that comes down to having great mentors. So uh, we had an excellent board member um, who uh, was uh, good friends with some of the higher ups in Yelp, and he um, sort of arranged the original meeting. And um, Matt, Alex, and I were in on that meeting, and uh, you know, t same pitch as we give to investors. We were just like, you know, we have this vision and we will do everything in our power to execute on it. And Yelp thought about it for a little while, and they mm -hmm. said, hey, you know, you guys don't have enough restaurants right now. And then priority number one became signing more restaurants. And as we grew and grew and grew, uh, this year, you know, Yelp reached back out and said, hey, you know, this is this is perfect. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and do this. And uh, so far, uh, I think that we've both been very pleased with the partnership. Yeah. And Eric, obviously being in a meeting like that with Yelp is company changing. What were sure. some of the tough questions they were asking you if there was like a fly in the wall listening to that? Yeah, well, I mean, really what it comes down to is with a company with over a thousand employees that is Yelp and, um, you know, with very significant revenues, a publicly traded company, they basically just need the justification to do anything um, when it comes to the bottom line revenue for their company. So we had to say, by adding online ordering to these restaurant pages, you know, this is really going to be beneficial for you guys as much as us. Um, because, I mean, if it was a one-sided deal and we say, hey, invest 100 hours of your research and development, but it's really not going to move the needle for you in any capacity. It's just going to be great for us. It's not much of a value proposition. Right. So um, really more than anything, what they needed to see was a lot of restaurants and, um, you know, a lot of demand for mm -hmm. online ordering. And we were able to demonstrate, uh, you know, even with, Grubhub's IPO that online ordering with restaurants is uh, really a booming field right now yeah. and that we had the uh, critical mass of restaurants to really make a difference for them. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you've had a lot of success. Eric, what's been a mistake that you've learned a lot from so far in the business? Sure. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I would say that even locally branding to 17 campuses was um, really limited the growth that we could have had. Um, my mistake probably more than anything has been um, that, uh, huh, that's, <laughs> sorry. Not many uh, mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, we, 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 we make mistakes every single day. They're just these little tactical mistakes. Honestly, that's the thing is that the devil is in the details on a business like this. And if we decided that um, we were going to pursue one thing at the expense of another thing, that really comes down to, yeah. uh, you know, the, there are so many what ifs and other things that um, when we, for instance, implemented this future ordering very recently, we could have probably done that a year ago and we would have significantly altered the tra trajectory of our company to be more successful. Yeah. But we held off because we tactically thought that it was a bad idea. So um, the devil really has been in the details. Um, personally, I think I've made mistakes when it comes to. Uh, taking things personally in arguments with founders um, and uh, that, you know, is something that I've had to grow uh, emotionally to basically learn to work well with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, other differing opinions. Um, and so, I mean, you know, as far as like, you know, this big banner mistake, I guess I can't think of anything right off the Just top. Just the little things here and there. It's the little yeah. things, absolutely. Yeah, it always comes down to the little things. What do you do to maintain a culture 
in, in you said one of your responsibilities is obviously getting people on board, seeing the vision, and when you, you have growing employees, what do you do to make sure that each individual? Because you know when you have one or two or three people, it's a sure. little bit a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, our office, we try to keep as fun as possible. We've got 60 Nerf guns here at, uh, we've got, you know, a big mural of Madison, um, our office overlooks the lake. So we really try to maintain this culture of, you know, work hard, uh, you know, but enjoy yourself while you're here because if you don't enjoy what you're doing you're probably inevitably going to burn out and we've seen people who came in but you know probably ultimately didn't uh, agree with the vision of the company or weren't completely committed to the company mission and they worked really really hard and they burned out so what we try to do is um, encourage our employees to spend time in the office but not always be working I mean, like, take a break, go play ping pong. Um, and um, what we've ultimately built, at least in my opinion, is a very cohesive work environment where people are really, really rejuvenated and excited every single day to go do some really uh, great work, uh, partially because they really enjoy the time in between uh, that the company provides for them. We've got a company out into a Brewers game in about a month. And we try to do that on a monthly basis yeah. where everybody in the company can get together. We'll all be in the same room together, like looking around and think, you know, every single person here is dedicated to the same vision mm -hmm. of what we want this to ultimately be. Yeah. So Eric, what's been a painful moment in business? A uh, painful moment really early on before we raised any money was that um, we uh, were trying to expand uh, without raising capital and we nearly hit the empty tank when it came to cash. And going to um, basically um, our parents and saying, hey, you know, it's going to be hard for us to make payroll on this next one. And, uh, you know, can you help us out there was uh, probably one of the hardest things that I've ever personally had to do. And mm -hmm. I know that that's the case with our founders as well. And our parents aren't multi, multi millionaires where they can right. blink. And, you know, that's not a big deal. Um, so really, that was probably the moment when I had to kind of humble myself the most and just say, hey, you know, um, we're really working on closing our first round of investment. But at this particular moment in time, uh, you know, we need this for the survival of the company. And that was, that was tough. That I was mean, tough. I, uh, I remember that to this day. Yeah, that was tough. Now, on the flip side, what's been something you've been amazed at that you've accomplished? One of those celebration moments. Sure. Um, so, I mean, honestly, probably the most recent one was the closing of Yelp. And uh, the day that that went live, um, everybody in the company was going to all these different Yelp pages and seeing Yeet Street ordering. And we had every Yelp order that was going through on the big screen TV. And we have a big bell that we rang uh, every time that one of those orders was going through. Okay. That was that was huge. I mean, and that was the kind of thing where it just justifies everything because you're just like, wow, this is so cool, and everybody in the room was so pumped up. Um, yeah. So, moments like that definitely make it all worth it. Love that. What mm -hmm. about who are some of your mentors? What's some of the best advice they've given you? Sure. Well, um, hands down, my parents are my best mentors and the ones that have shaped me into who I am the most. Um, I learn a lot on a daily basis from Matt and Alex, um, my co-founders. Um, also, our relationship with uh, Generator, the accelerator out of Milwaukee, we were their first inv uh, investment. So um, really, they've grown with us. So that's been a really cool give and take relationship in its own way. They've become uh, just a great accelerator. I think they've raised over $15 million for their companies. Um, mm -hmm. it, I mean, they've just done great. But uh, we have really grown together. So going to those guys to this day, I mean, that's a very special connection that we have. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, rounding it out, um, our investors and board of directors, you know, the fact that we have a guy who can pick up the phone and get us in a room with Yelp in the first place. Right. Um, and, you know, has done things in his own past to deserve that, um, you know, certainly means that we can go to some of the best in the biz for advice and really count on what they say. Yeah. So what's some of the value? It sounds like the accelerator was very valuable for you and the company. What's some mm -hmm. of the valuable advice you got from one of the, the heads from of that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that it was, uh, you know, kind of the recurring theme of this conversation about the devil being in the details mm -hmm. is, you know, I was having a conversation relatively early on and saying, you know, I kind of expected us to, you know, just one day wake up and we'd be 20 times, 20% 20 bigger than the day before and then the next day and so on and so on. And um, really kind of hearing from him, who had prone to, you know, just a fantastic business, um, that uh, that's more a fairy tale than reality. Uh, he said, you know, you're doing everything right for building a fantastic company. And, uh, you know, you can watch the movies about Facebook and, uh, you know, kind of think what you want. But this is truly the path uh, to building a great company. I mean, that's that's fantastic validation right there because, again, it's somebody who when they say that to you, you really know that they're qualified mm -hmm. to make that statement. Yeah. And it kind of validates that you're on the right track. You're not doing something wrong. You know, yep. if you're not growing fast enough. Like when he says that, you know, devil in the details, what did that mean? What did you do then or implement on a daily basis? What did that equate to? Sure. So um, once every week, um, our managers, and we brought on a fantastic VP of marketing, VP of sales as well, um, we, we sit down and we basically say, you know, where do we want to get by Friday? And then um, also, um, we have a quarterly management meeting where we say, where do we want to get by the end of this quarter? And um, when we're figuring out where we want to get by Friday on Monday, we're asking ourselves, and how does that position us for where we want to be by the end of the quarter? Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's how we attack like almost every decision that we make within this company is not um, you know what is this pie in the sky idea and uh, you know what can we do to you know sort of move in that direction aimlessly, but much more about like what is the very very precise step that we need to take to get to where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Eric, so what's your best advice? Let's say you meet three guys and they're about they're sitting on their living room couch where you were. What's your best advice for them to, to I guess, uh, other startups? Sure. Um, I mean, it's jumping in feed first. Uh, we were so underqualified when we first went into uh, you know this business uh, with no previous business experience and relatively limited technology experience before. Um, that we uh, we just basically you know had to go in with the confidence that we were going to make mistakes, but we learned from them. Um, if you want to come up with a list of excuses on why you shouldn't be doing something, uh, that list can be infinitely long. Right. But at some point, it just means you know you just have to toss that out and say, hey, you know. Take the leap of faith, and maybe it'll work, or maybe it won't work. I mean, um, we're fortunate that this has gained some traction, and we hope that it will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. But the story of Eat Street is still very, very far from close, and we, you know, we could fail at any moment due to situational factors or anything that way. But really, knowing that I've learned so much from this process has still validated it one hundred percent. I could never have learned all this working at a desk in a much larger company. Yeah. Eric, I have one last question for you. I really appreciate your time sharing sure. your valuable insights. Before I ask it, tell us a little bit more about Eat Street. What's you know what's exciting now? What are you working on? Yeah, so I mean, we're nose to the grindstone right now. We're signing more restaurants. Um, we are uh, trying to gain more consumers. We have some really cool technology pro uh, projects that are on the way that we'll be launching in early August that will really make online ordering even easier than it is right now. But our biggest focus right now is grow our consumer base and the number of people who recognize the word Eat Street. And then likewise, we want to grow the number of restaurants that we have a partnership. So right now, it's all about that hockey stick exponential growth. And that's that's what we're working towards. Yeah. And so what when people go on, is there a typical, like what do they do when they go on the site? Is it all the same or because you mentioned there's future orders and there's other couple options there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so the ordering process itself is very similar. And we'll just um, basically you put in your address, you see the restaurants that deliver to you, you get, you fill your card up with items, um, you go into the checkout, and um, it's at that point that we ask you questions like, you know, do you want this for now? Do you want this for later? But what we try to do product wise is create the most consistent experience every single time. So even if you're ordering, pizza one time and a sub another time for now or later, you know, what it'll really feel like is a very, very similar process time and time again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. 
So, Eric, my and everyone should check out, obviously, you know, Eat Street, um, you know, check it out. Um, where can people find you, more about you and um, uh, online? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, I, I would be more than happy if people reached out to me on LinkedIn, just Eric Martell, um, listed right under the Eat Street page, um, shooting, uh, you know, even me like a Twitter message. It's Eric D. Martell. Um, I love talking to people about starting companies. Honestly, it's been um, so validating personally that, uh, you know, I, I could go on all day about the experiences that we've had with this. So, Eric, my last question, obviously, this is Inspired Insider. So I want to ask, you know, when times are tough, what do you think about personally that motivates you to overcome tough times or challenges? Sure. So uh, hands down, it is my parents. And I've had to have a lot of conversations with my parents during the tough times. Um, My dad uh, basically uh, came from a family that hadn't really gone to college before. And my dad knew that um, in order to uh, go to college and be able to afford it without coming out with a tremendous amount of debt, he was going to have to work really, really hard. So yeah. he uh, he was running 15 miles a day back in uh, high school in order to wow. basically make the track team here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, at the same time, when he got to the University of Wisconsin, um, he found himself in the middle of the heap when it came to his own team. And so he had to learn a dose of humility after, uh, you know, kind of being the superstar up until then. Um, Likewise, my mom uh, has this uh, consulting business uh, uh, for agricultural commodities um, that she's built over the course of 20 years. But um, really, the majority of that success has come in the last several years. So she also is one that has had, you know, extremely high points. But also the low points of like being frustrated with the growth of the business, wanting things to go more smoothly than it actually has. And um, so really going to both of them is great because they both accomplished great things and um, had to work really, really hard for it. And they've also had a tremendous amount of setbacks. Um, so having conversations with them and like having relatable experiences has been really, really uh, fantastic for learning to be very comfortable with myself, comfortable with the business's growth, and yet hungry and competitive to always do better. Yeah. So at one point you said you went eight months without traction, and then Mm -hmm. you called your dad. Yeah. Well, and that was, uh, you know, that was just a conversation where he picked up the phone and he said, you know, I... uh, I kind of expected this would happen. Uh, That was my dad talking. He said, you know, uh, these things don't ever go the way that you planned on them going. But uh, personally, I, you know, have been in scenarios in the past like that as well. And um, when I uh, when I got to the University of Wisconsin, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, quickly crowned as like kind of the king of the track team. Uh, But over the course of, you know, my four years of work, you know, I went on to be the captain and um, that, uh, you know, if you stick through it, no matter whether or not you actually have like the tangible success, you learn a lot along the way. And he said, you know, a lot of the people that I met during that process became my best friends for life. And in the same way, you know, these are experiences that you're going to be able to take with you for the rest of your life for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that meant a lot to me again, uh, just like sort of knowing, you know, somebody as close as my dad had really been through a very similar scenario of coming in with one set of expectations, getting something else. And then, you know, things tend to work out when you work really hard, but, uh, either way you learn things. So, yeah. Eric, I just want to be the first one to thank you. It's been really valuable. Everyone check out Eat Street, and I really appreciate it, Eric. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.